I recorded myself writing my qualifying paper for my PhD program. Uh, I did that for a couple reasons. One's because I have a YouTube channel, and why not? I could just put it up. I'm sure someone's going to be interested in it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I figured I might as well do this. I'm the kind of person who, uh, like, feels a lot more productive when they feel like someone's watching. So I decided, hey, I might just record this thing and, you know, put it up. And that way I sort of feel, it keeps me on task, you know. Uh, so that, I think that actually did help in a lot of ways. Uh, so the video is, I guess, around seven and a half minutes long. And uh, it's sped up, I think, 40 times. So I think if you do the math, that's somewhere around uh, five hours of actual work. Uh, which, considering it's like a huge milestone, I mean, it's a minor milestone in your PhD. Um, that's a not very much work, uh, that's not very much time, you know. Uh, I didn't actually write all of it on camera, some I had written before from a couple weeks ago, so that's actually a little uh, more hours on that, um, but I sort of copy-pasted it in. Uh, but yeah, you're seeing my workflow now. You'll notice I'll often have, uh, you know, a window open for text, a window open for the preview, and one for the bibliography. That's when I'm sort of writing a theoretical stuff, and I need to remind myself, ooh, what's, what's you know, reference do I need here? I f always forget. I have a pretty good idea of, like, the kind of stuff I need to cite, but sometimes I, forgot I forget exactly who the name is, so I have to keep the references open. Um, and you also notice my wallpaper ch wallpapers changed. That's just uh, me leaving and coming back later. And I'll usually change my wallpaper, so you'll notice the wallpapers will change a couple times during this video. Uh, actually, probably a lot, maybe around eight or nine times. Um, but yeah, written over the course of a weekend. Uh, so to orient uh, you in where I am in the PhD, uh, I've been here for two years. I had a master's before, but you know that none of that carries over, none of the classes or anything, so it doesn't actually count for anything. Um, but I'm about two years in the program. You have to write these two qualifying, well, we call them prelims here. I don't know why they call them prelims. I think it's because they used to be exams. They were preliminary exams. Uh, but you have to write these two papers before you start uh, doing your dissertation, and that's what I'm doing now, uh, as I'm, I'm also finishing up coursework and stuff. Uh, so they should be, you know, relatively uh, decent, publishable papers about something. Um, if you saw my last video, I sort of alluded to what this is about. Um, of course, I work in linguistics, and what the paper's on is, uh, it's sort of like, basically when there's sort of been a problem in linguistics, though, so there are these things called syntactic parameters, and the idea is languages can vary in word order and things like this, and when you're a child, you have to learn all these language-specific rules as to where you put objects and where you put adjectives in, you know, reference to uh, the things they modify, stuff like that. Uh, and basically what I'm alluding to in this paper, and my analysis is on actual, actual word order of sentences, is that these parameters don't really exist. Uh, that really what's going on is that there are prosodic rules in each language, um, and each language will place its constituents and will place its words in ways that uh, get the kind of stress they need or get the kind of emphasis they need, uh, stuff like that. Uh, so really the analysis is basically each language has different stress patterns or prosody patterns, and you put noun, or you, you put like subjects and objects where they get certain levels of stress. That's basically it. Because if you look across languages, there are actually universals with reference to this. For example, if you have a tr transitive sentence in any language, the object is always going to have the most sentential stress, the subject will be stressed less than that, and the verb will usually have no stress uh, whatsoever. Uh, so basically I'm saying languages have different rules for where those stresses are assigned, and then they just put subjects, object, subject, subjects, objects, and verbs where those stresses appear. Um, so the implementation, like the theoretical apparatus I'm using, as I might have mentioned in the last video, is what's called optimality theory, uh, which is sort of edgy because that's usually only something used for phonology. Uh, it's supposed to be sort of a, um, a constraint-based, neural net-based um, analysis of like different prosodic and ph phonological constraints and how they, b basically how different languages will choose words based on how they are loyal to different constraints. Like, some things are diff just difficult to say, some things are, um, you know, just bizarre in different languages, and you want to avoid certain kinds of violations of these constraints. 
I'm just taking this and using it on a realm which has been traditionally just syntax, you know, just sort of word order and you just sort of say, oh, there are syntactic parameters. Um, now, generally my analysis is within the realm of, I guess what's nowadays called minimalism, uh, which is sort of the, I guess, the paradigm of choice in a lot of linguistics. Uh, and the, the uh, name is coined by Chomsky, but of course I'm doing things in ways I, you know, Chomsky does not endorse optimality theory. I don't think he understands it, to be honest. Um, but um, minimalism is supposed, the idea is when we used to have theories of grammar, when we went through, uh, you know, these sort of precur precursor phase, phases of government and binding, uh, there was a lot of theoretical apparatus that sort of accumulated over the years. People were positing a bunch of bullshit constraints for things. They were sort of making up... Uh, all these rules that, like, no one really had, um, you know, basically you have to say that these rules exist in the brain somehow or that they're learned by children, uh, but that's sort of undesirable, um, you know, for theoretical reasons and also because language evolved at such a quick rate, you don't want to have this extremely, you know, uh, complex language faculty. Um, so minimalism is a reaction to that, which basically seeks to uh, minimize the language faculty and, uh, you know, basically the complexity of language, the idea behind minimalism is the complexity of language isn't in language itself, but it's in external factors. And my paper is sort of in a in agreement with this in that the differences in word order, uh, you know, all these different uh, changes or all these different factors that affect word order are actually just external constraints. They're based on something like uh, phonology, which is not actually part of the language faculty per se, it's part of the externalization scheme. Uh, so that's sort of the theoretical locus of this. And I actually think I get a lot of, uh, I, I write about it in the paper, but I actually get a whole bunch of other stuff in addition to this. So um, if you have a conception of language where syntactic parameters don't exist, and everything is actually just learning phonology, um, it melds very, very well with the fact that children actually acquire prosody and syntax at the same rate, and it ends up prosody is actually part and parcel of how you process uh, sentences. Uh, so anyway, I've yapped on for quite long enough. The video is about the end to end. I didn't think I'd be able to talk for the whole time, but that's generally what I'm working on, and now you sort of see uh, the work getting done. So.